you're listening to Widowed Ear with Rosie Gilmoss and Lucinda Boast. We've invited some members of the world's most exclusive club to bravely share their stories. Join us for some honest conversations about living a different life, the crushing lows, the surprising highs and everything in between. Please note this is a podcast about death. Carefully read the episode descriptions and be kind to yourself. But for now, welcome to our podcast. Let us begin. Welcome back to Widowed AF. You're here with Rosie and I have got Emma Bellamy with me today. Hello, Emma. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. So, Emma, you and I have have never met. We've never crossed paths. I know very little about your story, aside from the, the paragraph in your application form. So, for me and the audience, this is going to be a really new story. What I do know is that your husband, Jamie, died from COVID. Yeah. So this is going to be quite, I think I hate the word, but quite triggering because John, my second husband, came very close to dying from COVID. So I think we're going to kind of hold each other's hands through this conversation a little bit. But in your own words, Emma, would you mind telling us how you came to be a member of this club? Yeah. So I lost my husband, Jamie, nearly three years ago on the 12th of April 2020, right at the beginning of the first down. He was 38 when he died. He died four days my 38th birthday, which I think he'd find hilarious because he always used to say to me, why do you need a week-long affair for your birthday? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, he, he made it all about him, I think. what he, That's what he did, Emma. Yeah, I think he's made your birthday all about him. Yeah. It's quite it's funny because, you know, obviously, Facebook, people write your Facebook, happy birthday, and four days after announcing my husband's death, people, birthday... Ooh. See, mine died 10 days after mine, so at least I do get a little window of opportunity to enjoy it. <laughs> so, yeah, that, obviously it was right at the beginning when it was all very unknown still, really. And so what happened? I mean, I didn't realise he was so young, 38, goodness me, because it was very much still seen in those days as an old person's illness, wasn't it? And although we were sort of, you know, cautious and afraid, I think we all felt that, oh, you know, it, it, yes, it's horrible, but it's not going to affect the people my age. And, and and even when John, you know, when we suspected he had COVID, I wasn't unduly worried. So what happened with Jamie? Well, I'll give you a bit of a backstory. So I'd been with Jamie for 13 years and we'd been married for eight years and we he was a chef he'd been a chef in a restaurant for many years so he'd worked lots of lots of hours like 60 70 80 hour weeks working till midnight for many many years and he decided that he wanted a bit of more work life balance he'd applied to go and work in a care home which was completely different but he absolutely loved it because he felt like he was making a difference to people's lives like with the 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 new people going into a care home and he also got his evenings back because his latest finish was like a 6 p.m finish and I'll always be thankful for those 18 months because the whole of our relationship by his days off we never spent our evenings together so it was a big change for him in his job then 2014 he lost Jamie's brother to suicide which was absolutely horrific he was oh, goodness also for his parents who have lost both their sons is just the unimaginable isn't it it's just terrific and oh I'm so sorry to hear that that's really really sad and obviously when that happened Jack was devastated and I really pushed him to live a good life still and I, I, I think that's probably what's helped me in, in my journey I hate the word journey but you so obviously yeah he worked in a, a care home and obviously we all think back to the beginning of 2020 and you kept hearing about this Wuhan place that none of us had ever heard of before and this virus and I remember saying to him like I'm a bit worried about it and he's saying to me don't be dramatic because I can be dramatic, Rosie. There's, there's no doubt about it. Well, I, I'm not saying that you're in good company, but it, it, <laughs> it may have been mentioned at times. <laughs> and obviously, I work in a health and beauty shop and the customers were starting going crazy buying all like the hand gels. We were out of stock of toilet roll, soap, everything in the world. And I was getting a little bit anxious about it. And he was like, no, we nothing to worry about. And then the day on Boris's lockdown day, he rang me at work and he said, given like this special ID that I need to carry like in case the police stop me we were like what like because it said on it Jamie Bellamy chef but obviously we didn't know Boris was going to announce the the lockdown so 
we went into lockdown and we just thought we were going to sit it out. I got furloughed and he actually had a week's holiday. So we were watching Tiger King, like everyone in the world. Yeah, we were just... Cocktails like, for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> and then on the Thursday of that first week of lockdown, I started coughing and probably it like yourself. It was a bit of a novelty. Like, oh, we've got it. Like, I think we've got it. And then on the Saturday, Bailey started coughing as well. And we both then had COVID quite badly for like 10 days as it was. And on day 10, better. The difference between me and Jamie is I'd got out of bed every day and we've got animals. Like I was sorting the cats and the dogs out sitting in the garden. He stayed in bed for a week, which wasn't unusual for Jamie. If he was ill, I'm sorry, men, but it is the thing. They do tend to take to their beds, don't they? <laughs> no comment. And he'd stayed in bed. And again, the difference between me and Jamie is he'd had a lot of really bad gastro, like sickness and diarrhea with his. And I remember like on the, the day, like my day 10, he was starting to have like really strange thoughts and he was he hadn't slept for three days and he was saying things like that the water was poisonous that he was drink, drinking and his mum had joined a cult they were telling him to go outside naked which <laughs> i wish the listeners could have seen my face then <laughs> but obviously i now know that was because his oxygen so low he was having like delusion but he was really worried he was having a mental health breakdown Jamie did so with his mental health over the years and he was really frightened that that's what was happening and was that perhaps be exacerbated by what happened with his brother I am assuming 100% yeah and he was clearly having a conversation him saying like what I'm gonna have like what Daniel and I said I just think you're really tired you just need to have a good sleep you're not being very well and he was very concerned. He was due back at work on the Wednesday. And this was like the Saturday that I'm not going to be well enough to go back to work. And I said, see how you feel nearer. And then on the, the night before he went into the hospital, he had the 111 call because he, I tried to reassure him, let's get some advice. And they basically just said, carry on doing what you're doing. And then on the, we had a really terrible another night and he had a GP video call on the Monday morning. Which the GP reassured him again, you've just got COVID and I'll prescribe you some sleeping tablets. So I went to get the prescription because I was now, now allowed out. And he hadn't been downstairs for nearly a week. And I said, Come downstairs, you'll feel a bit better. He hadn't eaten for five days. So I, he was a big bloke. So I got him downstairs, made him cheese and toast, tried to entice him with his favourite, and he wasn't having any. He just wanted to go back up to bed. So I went back upstairs and I just started watching telly. We've got a cockapoo, Willow. She's our baby. And she kept running down to me after about an hour and pouring me and then running back up to him. And it really made me think, hmm, the, it, her behaviour was strange. So I thought I'd better just go and check on him. And I went upstairs and he was gasping for air and he, he, his lips were blue, which it felt like it changed that quickly. It changed that quickly. And obviously, You've probably been there yourself, Rosie. I often think, could I have seen the signs quicker? No, it's it, it literally turns, doesn't it? Because it, it's interesting hearing you say you both had COVID because at the time I wasn't aware I had COVID because my only symptom was I lost most of the taste of smell and sense of taste and smell. And when you hear about saying the water, him saying the water was poison, so I do remember water tasting disgusting. But yeah, it, it, very similar actually, John. It was he's sort of unwell and even you know, do, working from home on his laptop almost, I think even the day before, and then just... That the following day, the deterioration and the sickness, and yeah, it's it's very familiar actually how quickly it turns. Yeah, so I obviously lips were blue. I rang nine nine nine, and we took. I hear on your podcast about the irrational, crazy things we do, but I, I thought you'd like this one. Looking back now, I think I'm a better. But I was on the phone to nine nine nine, and he had been in bed for a week. He hadn't washed for a week, and I thought, no boy of mine the hospital not being clean so whilst I'm 999 with my flannel giving him a little bed wash. little bed bath well I'm sure the medical staff appreciated that I, I agree he he did really appreciate it often him with a wet flannel <laughs> but yeah so the ambulance came really quickly and I remember I opened the door saying we've got COVID because obviously back then the things you were seeing on the news about COVID, which you can relate to because imagine the same time is, was in Italy when they had those big fish bowls on their head, yeah? It yeah. Was what came afterwards, what we saw in the UK, because it was very rare 
um, and I just remember saying to the ambulance, if we've got COVID, and them saying, it's okay, and they came in. And then their, like, sponsor car arrived. And I remember him shouting, come out and put your suits on. Then went back out and put their full the Hazeman suits, you know, like... Yeah. And I remember them, the fast responder shouting at as he had paracetamol. And he hadn't had paracetamol because I didn't know he had a temperature, which was silly, but I didn't. And his temperature was one, which is really high. And I remember them saying his oxygen was under 50. And they were saying red flag sepsis. And they asked me to wait downstairs. So it's a really surreal situation because I've never been in that situation so I was waiting downstairs and then the next thing I know the lady came down and said to me we are going to struggle to get him out because he can't walk down the steps and I said I've just brought him down the stairs an hour ago I'll bring him downstairs and they said no now he's in our chair. he needs to go on a stretcher we had a three-story house and I know apparently the stairways to the 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 last week is a narrower stairway and because he was six foot four and a big bloke, they were like, we're going to struggle to get him out on a stretcher. The next thing, there be fire engines in my street and 15 firemen in Hazeman suits. Oh, <laughs> Again, now looking back, it's so surreal. But at the time, it was just like, because he was in lockdown, everybody was out in the street. Every, and I just remember thinking, Dan was going to be really embarrassed about this. And like, I'm thinking, is it going to be like they take him out of a window? <laughs> oh my God. This is, oh, and it, this is, you talk about it feeling surreal. I mean, this is almost like a circus, like a spectacle. I feel really bad for Jamie, actually. Was he aware of all this or did he feel embarrassed or self conscious or was he sort of so poorly he wasn't aware? I, I suppose I'll never know, will I? Because I, I, I don't know. He, he looked really frightened and they actually brought him down on a stretcher. It was fine. They just needed more people because of the like the step. And I remember the ambulance lady saying to me, you're not allowed to come to the hospital. I knew that because I'd seen it on the news, yeah? Do <laughs> you want to come out and speak to him? So I went out and I grabbed his hand, looked at him and I said, listen, doctors tell you, I love you, going to be okay. But he looked really frightened, but he nodded at me. And they put him on the back of the ambulance and the lady <laughs> said to me, we're going to take him on blue lock. And I was like, okay. That didn't really alarm me either. And I remember thinking, they'll just give him some oxygen and he's going to be okay. I didn't think he was going to die. And he was on the back of the ambulance and he was looking at me and I touched my eye and I said, I love you. And he nodded at me. And that's the last time I seen him alive. They they, they, him. they told him <laughs> to call after an hour. And I did. And... I got the reception, he said, oh, he's being transferred to ICU. And I remember thinking, oh, ICU is. And I Googled it whilst on hold, and it came at intensive care unit. My heart, I thought, this is bad. Like, And then, the most surreal week of my life, Jamie's, he then got put on a ventilator in the early hours of the next morning. There was none of this video calling then. There was no... I didn't have any, there was no me speaking to him before he went on to a ventilator. I'd spoken to the nurse at midnight on the night he went in and she said, he's very tired. We might have to put him on a ventilator. I said, will you tell him that I love him and that Willow loves him? Willow's the dog. <laughs> and I, she did, I believe she will have done. And then the next seven days, he was put on dialysis. He was like lots of different things, but they told me he was critical, but stable, but I was just at home on my own because we we're in lockdown, which is the strangest. Like normally, you'd be with your family and your friends, wouldn't you? Yeah. But and also, you probably can relate to that, right? Yeah, I can. And it's that real. It's not knowing, is it? Because I used to. I had a. I was allowed to call once a day, and you would speak to a nurse who would have full PPE on through a yeah. phone, and they're giving you quite medical terms because they haven't got time to break it down to layman's terms. And then I had a friend who was an anaesthetist and she was working during COVID and she very kindly would ring me when she could. I would make reams and reams of notes and she'd try and explain to me what it meant. But yeah, it feels so out of your control. And this idea of you telling them to tell him that you love him, I used to do the same. At the end of every call, I would say, please tell him I love him. Please tell him we love him or we haven't forgotten him. Because that's what I used to worry about is this idea that does he, he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know that the world is like this because actually... I, we were sort of, I think we'd gone just into the first lockdown when John went in. And 
so people didn't really know what was coming. It was it's very scary and very lonely, isn't it? It just shows you as well that when Jack went in on the Monday, I think he went in on the sixth of April. They didn't confirm COVID till Thursday because then, like now, you get instantly. Yeah. That was how early it was. It was yeah. before they said. Yeah, I can remember John saying that the they put him into the cycle of isolation room and he said they turned up at the door because John was conscious when he went in. He he walked into the ambulance, but I remember just rushing and writing him a little note to put in his bag. So I don't know what I thought I was doing. You do, again, you do the very weird things, don't you? Yeah. And seeing him sort of walk away into the ambulance and, you know, that could have been the last time I ever saw him. And yeah, it's, I can really, you, your voice cracked as you told that and you can hear that real depth of emotion. But I'm very glad that you got to say that to him. Yeah, and obviously it was a really weird week. I would spend my days like getting an update because, like you said, I was allowed to call twice a day, and I would speak to them. Then I would ring his mum, then his dad, then my parents, then my brother, then my friends for Facebook posts. And it was like did your morning one reply to everybody, and then it happened again in the evening. Were you the same? Yeah, this is the blue. I'm just sort of like like lighting up with recognition here because yes, you are the Bush Telegraph. Everybody, not only are you trying to cope with the wealth of kind of fear and emotions and. But also everybody wants to know what's happening and you're the only person that knows. So, yes, like you, I, the other day, I ended up doing sort of like mass drop WhatsApps and I just sit like this on my phone, you know, texting frantically. And eventually my parents, they they they, they broke the law at the time, which is very unlike my parents. And they came to me because like, when you get the call saying it's, he's probably going to die, they couldn't be not be with their daughter. Well, she faced that. And she mummy said, oh, get off your phone. And I'm like, I can't. Like, I have to contact everybody because nobody else can. I remember like thinking I didn't want to go out, but I also remember thinking I've got to walk the dog. Really mad with me. I walked Willow all for a week. Like, so you don't, I'd only go for a little walk and I, I take her out. And it was surreal because you wanted to scream. A bit like when it happens, you want to scream at the world what's happened. I wanted people to know he was on a ventilator. And I feel like I did tell people I encountered at the supermarket. Like, I just oh. Well, it was all coming out. Like. There's a lady at Tesco's near the hospital where John was, and I'd gone to drop off a, a, a dictaphone, and I'd gone in, and I was just an absolute gibbering wreck. I'd probably gone into my vodka now in the state I was in at the time, and I just sort of vomited this this story onto her, including the fact that we were both widows. I left no stone unturned. This poor lady who was all she was doing was counting. You know, people have to be counted into Tesco's, and she just. But I did go back when he made the recovery and told her because I just thought I feel like I need to tell her that he was okay <laughs> it's cool. her name was Rose I still remember it isn't that funny <laughs> so then it comes Easter Sunday the 12th of April and I wrote I didn't sleep probably like you you're not sleeping and or you'd go to really deep sleep and then you'd wake up and a bit like that happens that's how you sleep is isn't it and I remember thinking it's Easter Sunday it's a religious day everyone needs to pray for Jamie we weren't religious at all yeah I emailed every church in Northamptonshire to get him on the prayer list. I was getting calls from like all different churches in the morning asking for details. The fact he died Easter Sunday is what Jamie thinks of the religion. <laughs> well, I was going to say, yes, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we, we also had lots and lots of people praying, which was very, very kind of them. And I try not to be cynic because I'm not religious, right? As, nor are you, but it, it, but it shows the desperation, doesn't it, that you were clutching at, at anything, praying to a God you don't believe in because the the alternative is that, you, that they die. And that feels so unbearable and unimaginable and unthinkable that you do unthinkable things to try and yeah. fight, that you're just going to like a bargaining and you're just trying to, you know, negotiate and grasp at any other explanation other than the one that means that you're going to lose the person you love yeah and I think at that point I knew it was really poorly and the time in which Jamie was in I'm when Kate Garraway's husband in and obviously god bless them that they're still battling now aren't they and I think I remember thinking with Jamie we're going to have a really long recovery ahead of us that's okay because we will manage that you that he's my person I love him I remember he'd had a bad day on the Friday and I remember crying to my mum saying, like, if he dies, we can't, I haven't got any money for a funeral. Me and Jamie live month to month. We did have savings. And I remember her saying, I'll pay for the funeral. She didn't, but that, that's a different story. <laughs> we can circle back on that one. 
Yeah. So yeah, it's just, it's a weird scenario. But yeah, Easter Sunday comes, my phone's in the morning and I spoke to my morning call and the nurse was someone I spoke to before because you get to know her time. And I remember her saying, no change from last night. And I said, does that mean he's stable, critical? And she went, you hesitate and I wouldn't want to give you false hope. Ooh. The only reason I'm saying that is because that's what they told me. And like, he's always... and I remember ringing my mum and dad being hysterical and them saying, she might just be a bit of a negative nasty. That might just, she... everybody's different. Ring back at lunch. Rang back at lunch. I've got the same nurse, same conversation. And I remember her te- working to get blood pressure, but I still didn't really understand. I knew it was poorly. Then at 3.28, the phone, and it was a doctor this time. It had never been a doctor before, a nurse. And she said, can I speak to Mrs. Bellamy? And I said, that's me. And he said, I'm really sorry to tell you there's a strong possibility your husband's now going to die. Oh, God. No. And I'm just on my own living room, and I'm like, yeah. And I said, can I come? And she, he said, yes, but you come at your own risk. It's a COVID war. I said, I don't care. Again, around things. All I can think, the dog's not had. I need to get the dogs to have a <laughs> So, she go in that garden? She wasn't going. In the- oh, of course not. No. <laughs> I remember thinking, if she weighs on the floor, it's, what's the worst that happened? In my head, I'm going to die when I'm going to be there for hours. I don't know. Or just a bit of a sur- wait, strange scenario. And I then drive myself to the hospital, which again, oh, your husband's going to die. You wouldn't non COVID have people with you wouldn't you yes of course I had his parents who'd already lost their son and tell them telling me he's going to die and i just remember his mum screaming go 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 and i was like on my way got to the hospital it was like a ghost town because the visitors there's no you park straight away when did you park it there was the car park was empty and i got out of the car and i had a really really strong sense of calm I'm a great believer in angel and I, I've had, a, I, I'm quite a spiritual, spiritual person. And I thought to myself, he's gone. I, and I saw a white feather in my feet. And I bent down uh, and I looked at the sky and I said, you've gone. And I put it in my handbag. And I then quickly get into the hospital, find intensive care. There's no one around to our, I found, and it's got all hazardous tape on the door. Do not enter, do not enter. I'm going to get in. And the nice nurse, yeah, and she rang through and she said, I've got Emma Bellamy here. And she, while she was on, she looked up at me and she said, he's only 38. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And then she's like, oh, shall I start ready? And she said, okay, I, I'll get her some water. And you just know, you know when you're going into a side room and you're getting some water, this isn't good. And the nurse, she was called, she came in and the first thing I thought how red her face was where the mask had been. It was red raw. Was she able to take it off while she spoke to you? Yes, yeah, she did take it off. She did. That's how I think I saw how red it was. Yeah, that was why I thought about it, because I, I guess I hadn't really considered that they might have to deliver news like this in PPE. And, you know, we're human beings. So much of the way we communicate is visual. That's, I mean, for them as well, very difficult. But hearing that they were able to take it off of that, I mean, I'm, I'm clutching at straws to find a positive here. I remember I'm... She was so kind. All of the nurses were incredible. She held my hand, actually. Yeah, I, the nurses were amazing with John, I have to say. They were so kind. Yeah, I remember I said to her, your face, your face is so red. And she was like, don't. She was just so selfless. She didn't care about her face. I Did you make, offer to make her a cup of tea, Emma? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said to her, he's gone, hasn't he? And she said, just. And I said, okay. And I said, can I bring his parents? And she said, yeah. And then I remember feeling like, no, I don't want to tell anybody. Because why I don't tell anybody this? And real for a minute yeah and I said can I will I be allowed to see him and she yeah and I said what will he look like because I've never seen anyone dead before and she said he'll look like he's sleeping but he's got some tubes in we're just taking some I was like okay so then there's the we've got to put you in the eye now I've had a gastric bypass and I've got really 10 stone but I was a size 32 I was a big girl yeah I'm my put in then is I'm not going to fit in I'm not going to fit in the stuff and I'm really big. I'm not going to fit. And she was like, "We will get you in PPE," and they did. And Bless you. we went in. That was a really. I feel this is really relevant to mention for a COVID or a lockdown day. I for seven days in my head imagined what intensive care looked like because I had to think. and 
in my mind, it was, was really dark and very dingy, but it wasn't. It was very ordinary. And even the curtains around the bed, it was red, but they purple. And it might seem a silly thing, but to actually see where he'd been, gave me And the guy in the bed, he had one of the CPAC maps. And it will haunt me forever to look dead because he must have just known the man in the bed next to him had just died and that I was that man's person. And he probably didn't know if he was going to live or die. And I'd live or die. And it will stay with me forever, that that moment. And they pull the curtain back. I know I've heard it on the podcast a few times. I may that never. I had heard it before the night my sister-in-law went and died. She made it that night. And I never wanted to hear it again, but yet it could be on me. It's like animistic, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it, it 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 comes out of you and you have no control. And then if you hear it from people that you love and you hear it echo back to you, you realise what this noise is. And it again, it, we talk a lot about every grief experience is different, but within each one, there are so many little pockets of similarities. And this does seem to be the, a very recurring theme. Yeah. I remember thinking that he looked like, his beard had got really big. He was very proud of his beard. He'd be very angry that his beard would be big. It's so funny that you went, well, it's funny, but this is, we find, we find humour in the dark. That's what we do. But but the, about his beard, because when John was admitted to ICU, I, he loves his beard as well, and I love his beard, and I've never seen him without a beard. And I can remember saying, has he still got a beard? But this was a, quite a big question for me, because I, and I, and I guess because you couldn't see them, you needed to be able to picture what they looked like. Yeah, yeah. And I... I, I I remember them telling me, like, I touched him at my own risk. But mm-hmm. I was, and I remember I held his face and I kissed him. I kissed him and I told him that I loved him. I told him that I'd love him forever. I, I hope you're with Dad, brother, and I hope you're causing mischief. And I said, I'm going to live a good life for you, Jamie. And at that point, I had that, that I was going to do that for him. On his arm, he had our wedding vows that he'd said to us. And I held his arm and I said, never above you, never below you or beside you. I said, I will love you forever. And I said, thank you for giving me the honour of being your wife. Because he proposed to me, he said, will you give me the honour of being my wife? And I just, then I had to leave. I didn't want to go. And I remember then saying to the nurse, can I go to my parents' house? Because now I can't go be on my own. And because I've just been in a COVID intensive care. And she said, yeah, but you need to wash your hair. Change your clothes and you need to wash your hair. So I then obviously ring everybody and tell everyone. And everybody's so ox. And then I drove myself home, which again, you can't. Like, that. And I got home. I stripped off in the hallway. I washed my hair three times. Random things that we do. I then washed the dog. Okay. <laughs> I thought it might be in her fair. And I'm thinking. Now I think Jackie just died. I'm giving the dog a. I know, but we didn't know how it was transmitted, did we? Because I, I talked briefly about my mum and dad coming to stay, which then was obviously then you could form these bubbles. But mum was making me because I think I kept the economy going actually during lockdown with my Amazon deliveries because entertaining four kids in lockdown is no joke. But I used to get these deliveries, and my mum would sort of get me to spray them or leave them in the garage for 24 hours, and you just the madness. But I also because any time I went near the hospital because I dropped dictaphones off, and I would have to do a full strip. My dad would have to like go like leave the house while I'm getting, mm-hmm. in the utility room and then run upstairs, bleach myself almost, and come back down again because they were older, so they were obviously very very frightened. And I remember the day after Jane died, my brother into the garden because everyone was in the garden didn't. I remember. This is my brother. Honey, I'm really close. And he stopped. And he's no. He's like, we're not. No, I don't want you to do anything to mum and dad because he was working. And it felt so cruel. Yeah. Jamie is died, and I can't even think of my brother. Yeah. I had friends whilst John was in hospital, and they would drop the food at the end of the path down to my front door. They did the food shop for me, and which was really kind. But I can just remember standing there. And it was my friend's actually now husband, and he stood at the end of the drive, and I was like, and I just remember this kind of like, I, I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm and and he was like, and you could see he wanted to hug me, and um, yeah, but we were so frightened, we were so frightened, and, and the last thing any of us would have wanted to do would be to spread this awful, awful illness to anybody else. Yeah, because like we didn't. The only and I think it really hurt me when people say, did he have like, because regardless if someone had, it doesn't. Okay, that they died. Like, but if we're gonna do that, 
the only thing that Jamie had was he was very overweight. Yeah. So, but that doesn't mean he deserved to die. No, yeah? of course not. Also, but it is the and I, I, it's quite an intrusive question. You do. I always feel quite bad because people do. They tend to ask, oh, they sort of skirt around it, don't they? Do they have any health conditions? And John very openly says that he was carrying a couple of extra stone, but he was by no means, you know, in the dangerously obese category. I think he, whether it's, I, I wonder whether there'll be some huge investigation. We'll find out, you know, why some people were more susceptible than others. But it just felt like Russian roulette, didn't it? That's what it felt like. Yeah. And then you go on the whole funeral, like, I went to a funeral recently for somebody who from work and there was a hundred people I counted. Well, because your mind goes to yeah. and I was allowed ten people for Jamie's funeral. And how do you choose ten people for the funeral? And that decision that I've made like made irreparable damage between me and Jamie's mum. And she didn't agree with the ten people that I clutched or stand by I chose the ten people I thought Jamie would want to have. And my mum he had been a massive part of Jamie's life. They had a lovely relationship. My mum could come to the funeral within that 10 people because she said, you need your dad. My mum sat outside and watched it on an iPad. Like there was probably about 15 people outside. We live streamed it and so many people watched it. But No, it's not the same. I took an enormous amount of comfort from Ben's memorial because of how many people there were. And I went to a funeral at the end of last year, to, for, sadly for a friend's husband, and it was packed, you know, standing room only. And I thought, it's so important to do this. It's important for the person left behind that everybody gets together and it's a tribute and a, a way of showing respect and a way of feeling like you've got a bit of support around you. And so to not to have that taken away from you, as well as this... What I'm hearing is this, this complete lack of control, you know. It's, you don't know what's going on. You're getting, you know, limited information because that's all they, they can give you. You're not allowed to be there. And then you can't even say goodbye to him properly. And that's really cruel. And things like, which people might not, we could use the coffin. It had a coffin because it was a COVID death. We wasn't allowed to dress. I was going to put him in his pants because that boy loved in his pants. But he wasn't even allowed to be in his pants to be naked and Tell you something about Jamie. There's one thing more than being in his pants, he loved, it was being naked. Oh. So he said that. Well, we're all picturing Jamie naked now, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> I'd, I'd come home and he'd be watching tech, and I'd be like, Who watches telly naked? And he'd be like, Me. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that, that <laughs> formers of a COVID or a lockdown, yeah, that it, that, all of those things, we couldn't, his parents weren't able to arrest, and you know, your scenario, it. A, diff, a difficult what happened in you is added trauma isn't it it's not you, they could I think for his a lot of the family they couldn't go to see him it didn't almost make it real yeah yeah I could I can yeah I get that actually and I think because we were living in such unprecedented and quite surreal times I think we all felt like we were in a, in a sci-fi movie or something didn't we some sort of apocalypse film so the whole thing felt unreal so yeah. no wonder it felt you know this kind of detachment from reality for you at the time so you say that you fell out with his mum yeah I think I've got a, a, the most respect for his parents like that it's so sad what's happened in their lives but Jamie had a challenging relationship with his mum at the best of times unfortunately it was damaged don't know who I chose for the funeral. how do you choose 10 people and the idea that some that people would be angry with you for not making the right choice when you've been forced into an untenable situation where really the only person that really should have been there is like you you were the, you were the the epicenter of this disaster and it's really everybody just needed to wrap, wrap you up and not give you <laughs> really awful decisions and then criticize you for making them but i feel quite i feel quite protective of you in this situation actually possible situation and it was hard times lockdown because i think i imagine like i could talk from my my experience imagine if someone loses someone to cancer you're faced with cancer all day every day but with covid it really was part of our all day every day for many even today isn't it and mm. there was no avoiding it and people would talk about it at work get COVID. it's like anything it's like fun to get pregnant isn't it there's pregnancies yeah. I, I i get that but covid felt a little bit more intense than that on that note, can I ask you what, how you felt about the, the COVID deniers and the claims that it was a hoax? And because I was, I found that really, well, I suppose it was hurtful. It was very hurtful because 
how dare they say that this isn't real? Like, look, look, look what happened. Yeah, it, it was difficult. And I actually went on Panorama, my claim to fame, when the death toll sadly hit 100,000 there. And they had told me before, you need to change your face pictures and things like that because you contacted whatever they're called, like the conspiracy theory people. And I thought, of course I'm not going to. I did get some messages and I got some really horrible things. People saying that he was a walking heart attack anyway. I was clearly an actress employed by the BBC, which was a favourite of mine because I've always thought I'm... I, I'm speechless and that doesn't happen very often. That is unbelievably cruel. I'm going to hazard a guess that person's used the hashtag be kind at least five times in the last year because that does tend to be the sort of thing. And we do... It doesn't seem like too much of an ask to just not be horrible to somebody who's just lost their, their husband. I mean, it doesn't feel an impossible ask. Emma, you, you mentioned briefly that you'd had a gastric bypass. So talk to me a little bit about this because you, you refer to it as being the last thing that he could gift you, don't you? Which I, I think that's rather nice. So tell me a little bit about that if you're, if you're happy to. So me and Jamie had battled infertility for 10 years and it never happened for us. And it all went down my weight. I'd have gyny problems, which are all back dated to my weight really just another side note I know people and I can't compare to what it's like had a child and for what you must have gone through perhaps losing their daddy but for me I found it but when I'd read and they only kept going for the cheese because it was their mate you know like, should I go in do you know that it's a sort of a layer isn't it and it, it's not a competition it's crap for us all that it's not a competition and I can't just be like for them daddy but it was, again, that was an added trauma. Me and Jamie had battled for such a long time for a baby and it had happened for it. Well, it, hearing you talk about this and and one of the, note, the notes I made ahead of speaking to you is I've just written infertility and then I've just written the word stolen and underlined it because, yes, you've talked about the difficulties that I, I'm a mother, you know, I have children that the parents face when they're widowed. But in all honesty, yes, you're navigating their emotions, but it kind of is a distraction in, in, in a lot of ways because you have to focus on them. But for you, you've had, not only has your husband been stolen, but your future, because you haven't had the children that you wanted to have together. This is the person you've been with for 13 years and you're trying to have children. And this option has now been completely taken away from you. And I think I think it's important to touch on that because you're right. I mean, yeah, when you talk about the ch widows, particularly young widows, often the first question is, oh no, were the children involved? Because it's almost like it can only be that awful if there were children, but it's just as awful for you. Yeah. People would say to me, like, children, and I said, no, no, it never happened for us. Oh, that, that least good. And I'm sure it is good for, like, I, I'm, you wouldn't want to put up, you wouldn't put on a little child, but that didn't help me. <laughs> Those, it, it, and I also think we get the, we do get to kind of keep a bit of them. So, you know, I look in the eyes of my kids and I see him and, and it was actually quite difficult at first because they very, they do look a lot like him, but I get huge comfort from that. So I, you know, I think it's just another injustice actually for you. Yeah. For my, for my sister-in-law, she was the time when we lost Daniel and for her little girl, Jane was such a massive part of her life. That was her connection to her daddy. So I can see it from that, from her point of view, how difficult being but it did feel like another another loss really that I, it, I also could then look back at my marriage and feel quite sad that I'd spent so many years focusing on having a baby and almost being obsessed and Jamie would always say to me you you are enough if it doesn't happen for it I don't know that I ever said that to him but he was enough he was but I don't never say that, that I ever said that to him because I it was by pledging life for us to have a baby so obviously I've gone on a, a tad there, but no, I know it's really it, this is really important I've not had a guest on yet that's talked about about this issue so it's actually something that I'm really glad that you've been brave enough to talk about so thank you thank you. I had some pre-cancerous set back in 2017 and it had always been a case of having hysterectomy and I'm adamant that no you're not doing that to me and luckily I medication route so I had to have yearly biopsies eventually, and thankfully it never went to cancer but they told me in 2021 in February if you didn't get your weight down it wasn't a case of this, a case of when and I thought I don't want I need to tackle my weight I'm, you need to sort yourself out and you ever considered weight loss surgery and I was really offended I was like no 
I do. <laughs> Brain researched it and I decided that I was going to go private. And what has happened was me and Jamie didn't have life insurance. It was really silly, but we got refused because of my weight. We applied, and when he died, I had a massive mortgage and <laughs> I could have afforded to stay there. But also but the fact that you can't get life insurance based on somebody's weight, which we now know, you, yes, it's not the best indicator of health, but it doesn't also, it doesn't always, BMI is such an outdated method of me- measuring somebody's health. And so, you know, life insurance, which could have provided some protection, it wouldn't have helped you emotionally, but it would have meant that you could stay in your home. And you weren't even able to access that. And oh, it, it just feels really, really cruel. And it was, yeah, it was, so I sold the house. And another thing I thought I wanted to mention, because I've heard it a few times in, in our weird world, that people say you should make big decisions in the first year. And I don't agree with that. If you're you make an decision, that's okay as well, because I know the night Jamie, I said to my friends, I'm, uh, I'm going to go so I'm going to move back. We lived like 20 miles from my parents. And I very knew that night that's what I was going to do. And three years on, that was a decision for me. So if that's you, that's okay as well, yeah? Yeah, well, I think you're right. I think the rules are very, very, they don't apply to everybody. You can't apply a set of rules to widows. We're all different. You can't, I know... I never in a million years thought I would be married again. But the rules I imposed on myself in the early days were not the rules I chose to live my life by. And I think you have to, as a, a grieving, particularly we're talking about widows, you have to become quite flexible, don't you? Because life doesn't look like you expected it to. And you talk, you know, we talk about this kind of injustice and having the life stolen because people tend to focus very much on the life that you had and, you know, Whereas actually, there's an entire lifetime, you know, we're very, we could have 40 years more together, and that's been stolen as well. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just thought I need to do something about my weight, and I'm going to have a gastric bypass. I used the remaining money on my house sale because I downsized. I've moved back to my hometown. Luckily, I was able to get a money on my own, and I used that money. It was a thousand pound the operation. But I felt like last thing that Jamie could do for me someone who's battled with his weight all his life he knew my challenge I've had with my weight and it's been a life-changing thing and I am a different person because I've lost Jack I think you're anybody who walked our path I in every way I, I'm a, and I'm unapologetic an apologetic person that I am yeah it does change you doesn't it it changes you beyond recognition in in some ways I think overall, I would say oh, I've changed for the better, but along the way, I've stumbled a few times. You know, I've made decisions that I maybe shouldn't have done or I've done things I am not proud of. But I think one of the things to remember when people are grieving is that they aren't, that there's no manual, is there? there's no guide. And also your feelings are so reactive that you, you may be saying do things you don't want to. So can I be really personal and ask you how much weight you've lost? Yeah, just a 10 stone. Congratulations, because that is no mean feat. Because Lou has talked quite openly that she's had a gastric bypass as well. She had one post bereavement because she lent into, <laughs> she talks very candidly about the fried chicken. So she's had one and it, it has transformed her life. And it's life changing surgery, isn't it? When you are at the point where, you know, for yourself, you became at high risk of having cancer and you've made a choice that in order to live the best life that you can and to honor Jamie and, you know, like we've said, we could still have another 40 to go, you know? You've given yourself another shot at life. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I also knew that I needed to challenge, I needed to tackle my weight, and I feel physically so much better. I used to live on cocodamol at work. I'd be taking eight a day, and I don't sometimes I'll take one, but it's massive. Yeah. That And even the confidence, my Friends say to me, like, it's like you hibernated for 10 years. And, like, now we're always out partying and having like, the best yeah. time. <laughs> and, well, I mean, on that note, I do like to find out, because I'm a nosy bugger, whether any of our guests have dipped their toe into the dating world. Yeah, like, I'm really in love. And are you? I didn't know that. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I, I definitely, at the beginning, if people mention the word date to me, I would feel physically sick. And I think we could probably all relate to that. I'd feel like, oh, God, no. How dare you? <laughs> How dare. And I, did, and I very knew I didn't want to, but two things happened, which I think are quite funny. 
I had a bit of a memorial for Jamie. I had his ashes. I had his ashes interned and I had a bit of a wake and his friends came. People couldn't come to the funeral. And I'm not after any of his friends before. <laughs> I was wondering where this was going. <laughs> I remember thinking, oh, my God, they smell so good. And that's the first time I'd faced a man again, yes? Yeah. So I was like, okay. And then, this sounds so bad, I'm going to A guy joined our widowed and young group. And when someone joins it, the, the lady who will run it will say, can everyone welcome Emma? And then that person will say a little bit of a thing. And this guy joined, he lost his wife. And I remember thinking, gosh, he's handsome. I then didn't sleep for two nights because felt so guilty because his wife had just oh, oh, yeah, I get it I get it we're, we're so, it's such a complex I remember, web I remember telling my brother my sister-in-law like I'm really worried I'm such a bad person and they were like did you slide in his DMs and ask him to go out and I was like of course I didn't <laughs> <laughs> that was the thing the fact that I know somebody and I thought maybe I'm ready to start dating help me down like down it happened when on Bumble the first boy I went date with I'm still with 15, 16 months later and yeah he's called Kev and he's not a widow no he's not not a widow I think for me I think it was really difficult dating a widow I'm not mean you I mean someone dating us with being a widow yes. yeah. I think it must be quite difficult whoever dates us because we're not straightforward are we and I think you have to be a special kind of person much like Camilla Parker Bowles, you have to accept that there will be three of you in the marriage or the relationship. In, in our house, there's four. I mean, poor John, two wives. Um, yeah, I get that. And I think you're, it is difficult to date a widow because, I mean, in some ways, because I think sometimes if you've got a really bitter divorcee, they're going to be kind of, they're going to have more barriers up actually sometimes than us because we are, I think, open and receptive to love. I know that sounds a bit hippie and woo-woo, but I do think that, but you're hearing you talk about that. So you, I, I mentioned in the past that John and I, I took him out for his birthday. And as he dropped me off at home, I just had one of those kind of fuck it moments and walked back over to the car. He ran down the window and I snogged him. Mm -hmm. And it was, again, it was that like, oh, oh, that was nice. You know, <laughs> you smelled nice. And I just remember thinking, if you, you sort of think, oh, well, that's not dead then. <laughs> it's definitely like... Ke Kev always says, like, and we we found humor. I think we all dark humor. Like, he always says, like, you're the best person today because there's no crazy ex hanging around. <laughs> yeah, well, there is. Yes, yeah, there is that. There is that. But I would always, if you're horrible to me, he'll haunt you. <laughs> well, yes, yes, there is that. Yes, and I do know people who keep their their late husbands or, or wives' ashes in the house as well. You know, we we're, we're a complex breed. So, man, it's a bit personal. And feel free to to tell me to get my sticky beak out but I was wondering whether you, you thought children might be something that you would like in the future still or whether that that ship has passed for you yeah no I'm definitely open to it and yeah. you just I, I think I've it hadn't happened but if it did happen it then I feel like we have found a really nice like I never thought I'd find love again I remember very early on in my widowed world, my boss you've got too much love to give to the world who never love again and that was me and though I believe different it will never be the same as it was with Jamie that doesn't mean it's bad no, it doesn't mean it's less and that's the other thing I, I compare it sometimes and again it's a bit cruel to use this with you but like when you have multiple children you 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 still love them you know I don't love the fourth one more less than the first because I've run out like <laughs> it doesn't work like that and yes that that you're saying about having too much love to give I think that I think you know I love being in a relationship I, I I thrive and I'm not saying that you should jump into a relationship with anybody just to not be on your own but if you are fortunate enough to find somebody that you love and that loves you and that makes you feel alive again then my god you grab that with both hands and you don't let go and we've had some like really funny things as in like hey, quite early on I have ashes in the house I've got Jay, some of his ashes in a heart and they're on the bed they're not now but they're on the table and one morning Kev just picked up and was like oh this is nice and I was like oh yeah. ashes <laughs> he's watching us he's in the bedroom <laughs> oh brilliant there was another really funny occasion he'd gone away with work and he just picked up some black socks and he'd been at mine he's some black socks and I went and met him after work and he had Jamie's socks on now I keep some of Jamie's socks because I've got J's on it I'm having like a griefy day wear Jamie socks no one knows Jamie socks but me and he just picks up a pair of black socks poor boy yeah I was like you've got Jamie socks on 
he literally walked in a dead man's shoes, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about what he's done to his wife, though. A few times he's referred to Jamie as my ex. And I'm like, he's not my ex. And like, he doesn't mean it in a disrespectful way, but he's just like, oh, hey, what's the right terminology? Yeah, I, yeah, that's that's a common one, actually. That, and it doesn't happen in a, a dual widow relationship. But yes, I, I can see that because I have had people refer to Ben as my ex. So you probably, I mean, as you know, I refer to them as my dead and my alive husband because sometimes that's the clarity you need. I'm like, I sort of think people know I'm a widow and I say, oh, my husband's coming. Okay. So they'd be like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, Emma, I've just noticed we have been talking for nearly an hour. That's how good this chat has been. I have loved talking to you. That was really interesting. I'm just having a quick check to see because I make notes while we talk to see if there's anything I wanted to talk to you quickly about before you go. I, I mean, I just made a couple of notes. You know, the fact that he left his job being a chef to go work in a care home to spend more time with you. I think that speaks volumes about him. And and, and I'm very glad that you've got that time together. Ben set up a, his own business and he works. He tended to work abroad for a week a month, but the rest of the time he was at home. And it meant that the children knew their dad really well because for a lot of children, their dads are working you know, very long hours and maybe they get to see him at weekends. So I will, for the rest of my life, be grateful that he did that. And I, I think that, yeah, it speaks volumes about the kind of man Jamie was and how much he loved you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Emma, take very, very good care of yourself, please. And thank you once again for being part of Widow Day F because we we think we, are, we value every single person that takes the time and is brave enough to share their story with us so i hope you're proud of yourself because i am thank you and keep doing the amazing work like i i said i know when jamie first i couldn't read i couldn't and the pod i said podcast and some said some were really bad but yours even like i'm nearly three years on i've got so and support and like i've laughed and i've keep doing the good work thank you so much that's really lovely to hear take care emma bye-bye Thank you for listening today. We'll be back with you soon for more from the front line of loss. But for now, as you were.